Hello, Scott Seaton, music director of your North State Symphony here this evening on a, another edition of Just Ask. It's uh, great to, uh, to be connected to you all once again. And uh, it's also great, uh, I wanna thank our, our wonderful sponsors for these Just Ask series, uh, KRCR and all that they do for us in the North State Symphony and the region. Um, so we, we couldn't bring these to you without their support. And um, tonight we have a very special guest who actually performed with the North State Symphony uh, two years ago now in November, 2019 with uh, Aaron Copeland's clarinet concerto. And I'm of course talking about John Ye. And before I bring him on, I just wanted to very quickly recap his amazing career before he goes into a little more detail. But uh, he has been a, mem a member of the Chicago Symphony for over 40 years. I think the exact number is 44. He can confirm that when he comes on. He's also a founding member of the New York New Music Ensemble. He's a Grammy winner. Uh, native of Los Angeles, he began studying the clarinet at age six years old, spent two years at Juilliard, and then uh, joined the CSO in the at first in the role of solo bass clarinetist uh, in 1977. So, um, and I'm leaving out a lot. There's so much that this guy has done. He's such a joy to talk to. So without further ado, here is John Ye. John, how are Hi, you? Scott. Good, good. <laughs> Hi everybody, good to see you, or it's good to be seen again. Right <laughs> good to see you, Scott. And, oh, and likewise. Great to uh, be able to, to reconnect again like this since our performances of the Copeland Concerto back in November of 2019, which I enjoyed so much. And and uh, just to just to give people uh, who may not uh, remember that particular performance, I actually have a little little tiny one minute snippet of of that show. So, just to to reacquaint us to this conversation, here's um, a short excerpt from the 2019 North State Symphony performance with clarinetist John Day of the Copeland Clarinet Concerto. I love that moment where you're in your your cadenza and you you go 
to the, the super oh, stratospheric node and everyone's like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a, a Lady Gaga moment singing the national anthem. <laughs> oh, that was the moment though. That, I, I aspire to that. <laughs> Lady Gaga singing the national anthem. That's um, gonna be my model. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was a, a fun performance. And uh, obviously piece yeah, you've, you've played many, many times. Um, but before we talk about music and all of that, let's talk about you and your background. So, you know, I, I've already stated that you began clarinet at age six, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you come from a, a musical family and also a, a sort of a mathematics science-based family. Your, your father was a scientist and a singer. Your, your mom was also a scientist and a pianist. So mm -hmm. tell us about that unique background and how you got to where you are today. Well, okay. So um, back when I was really little, my parents both had music in the house all the time. They had the radio going, the good classical music station. My dad had a nice big record collection. So later in my teens, I would go raid his record collection. <laughs> <laughs> but they were both scientists by training. Like you said, my, my dad was a, an engineer. He was worked in the aerospace uh, industry. And so that's why when I was born in Washington, DC, we moved to California and to Los Angeles when I was two. Mm -hmm. And my mom was uh, a biochemist. So they, they both worked in the sciences and they expected me to continue uh, sort of in their footsteps as a scientist. So I, I excelled in all the scientific um, classes at school, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, calculus, all of that stuff when I was in high school. So <laughs> when I went to college, it was at UCLA as a pre-med major. Mm -hmm. But the whole time, I really loved to play music. I was, you know, like I was brought up with music in the house. My parents took me to a concert when I was five. I remember this very clearly. We went to the uh, LA Philharmonic when they first played in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. It was brand new at the time. It was like 1962. Hmm. They just had their first concerts in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And my parents took me to one of those and we had really great seats in the dress circle. I remember sitting there and I, I still look at the program these days and it was just, you know, uh, uh, something that made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. So then about that time I was taking piano lessons. Um, my mom had taken piano lessons when she was um, a youngster back in China. Both my parents emigrated from China in the uh, late forties and early fifties. And mm -hmm. My mom had taken piano lessons. My dad um, was actually a, a vocal conductor. He, he'd studied voice and he conducted his high school chorus. Oh, and wow. then when he came to America to go to graduate school, he, um, he sang in the, um, the Harvard Glee Club and, and got to perform with the Boston Symphony. He went to Harvard and got his doctorate in mechanical engineering there. And so it, music was really part of both my parents' lives, um, but it was sort of a hobby for them, yeah. and they figured that would be the same for me. But um, it, it just got to be my passion because every spare moment I would be listening to, you know, either my dad's record collection or the radio or playing on the weekends in, in youth symphony. I, I um, became a member of the American Youth Symphony in Los Angeles, which was conducted by Meili Mehta, Mm. And Meli is the father of Zubin and Zarin Mehta, you know, famed uh, musical family. Wow, there. okay. But Meli was the foremost uh, classical musician in India in the, in the 1930s and 40s. And then he emigrated to America and um, they got him to be in this Curtis String Quartet. He was a fine violinist. Mm. So he joined the Curtis String Quartet and then he got hired to be the music director of the uh, the conducting teacher at UCLA. So when I was a youngster, I joined his orchestra when I was 13. And I learned everything about orchestra music from Mele. It was just, we played, and he was very ambitious. I mean, it was a very good orchestra. It would, it, I was the youngest member, you know, at 13, mm -hmm. and they had, um, mostly it was college musicians. A lot of the students at UCLA, some other um, colleges nearby, These it was a youth orchestra, but it was really sort of like a 
college age pre-professional orchestra and and i was you know lucky to be in it at such a young age but he, he would be be playing all the beethoven symphonies the brahms symphonies the strauss tone poems were big for him so so i got my um first experience at all the great pieces you know ein heldenleben was a it was a huge one that he did and don juan and, and don quixote and you know the all the brahms symphonies the beethoven symphonies just kind of took us through our paces and we'd get to play uh concertos with great soloists because mm -hmm. You know, knowing uh, being Zubin's father, anytime there'd be uh, a soloist that came in to play with the LA Philharmonic, or um, and maybe you know he he'd meet them and he'd say, "Hey, next year, would you like to play with the American Youth Symphony?" So so I got to play the Brahms Violin Concerto with Yehudi Menuhin, uh -huh. and then in those days, the uh, concertmaster of the LA Philharmonic was um, Sidney Hart, who had prior to that been concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony. And so we played the Beethoven Violin Concerto with him. So it was just like top level musicians and mu music making in a youth orchestra. So that inspired me and, and I had friends that played in the youth orchestra. So Melly would always say to us, you've got to play chamber music. That's the most important thing because when you play chamber music, you get these skills, you hone your skills of music making and you take these skills back to the orchestra. And when you get to the orchestra, you really enhance orchestra music making by having your chamber music skills. Exactly. So I took that advice to heart and, you know, I dutifully did my homework, did my, you know, calculus and my uh, uh, physics. And I got into the pre-med program at UCLA and I continued to play in the American Youth Symphony. And at the time, I um, through high school, well, I should back up a little bit because the reason I ha played with the North State Symphony Orchestra is because my very first clarinet teacher has a connection with the North State Symphony. And, and it's through a gentleman named Keith Herrett, yes, who was sure. your... Um, uh, executive director right. several years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keith is the son of Gordon Herrett, and Gordon Herrett was my very first clarinet teacher back when I was six years old in Crazy. Los Angeles, California. <laughs> so uh, I hope you're listening, Keith, but hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 Gordon Herrett was very patient with me, and he gave me the foundations for playing the clarinet um, when I was six, and then four years later, uh, when I was 10, he says, you know what? I've pretty much taught you everything I can. You, I'm, I'm pushing you out the door. You mm -hmm. have to go find another teacher. And and my, my parents and I said, gosh, you know, well, we love you, Mr. Harrett. You know, we don't, we don't want Johnny to go to a different teacher. Well, he <laughs> says, um, no, it's time. You know, he knew when to push me out the nest. And we kept in touch and, you know, his his wife and he would invite me over and we'd have parties at their house in Topanga Canyon. We'd make ice cream. I remember it was just lovely. We, we'd, we'd carry on a social um, connection, even though he wanted me to study clarinet with a different teacher. So that about that time, I went to study with Gary Gray, who recently retired after 50 years of teaching at UCLA. It turned out oh, that right. Gary Gray was the professor of clarinet at UCLA. And I uh, studied with Gary through junior high school and high school and two years of college. And then after during my second year of college, after having won all the uh, music awards at UCLA, including the Frank Sinatra Musical Performance Award, and everybody in the music department was kind of looking at me and saying, who is this guy? You know, he's not even a music major and he's won all the um, music awards. And so I thought, well, you know, and by that time I had gone to Aspen and Aspen, uh, when I graduated from high school was sort of the, my, my parents gift to me for the summer. You can go to Aspen, enjoy the summer before you start uh, in your pre-med program. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really enjoyed Aspen and I learned a lot and I met a lot of incredible musicians there. You know, I got to work with the members of the Juilliard Quartet. Right. And 
uh, uh, you know, met for the very first time, Itzhak Perlman, Pinkert Zuckerman, Lynn Harrell, uh, uh, Jimmy Levine, all these great artists that I, you know, had seen on record, you know, heard on recordings, seen on TV. I was like rubbing shoulders with these great artists. So that really inspired me. And people were saying, and, I, and on top of that, I won the concerto competition at Aspen my my first year there. Oh, wow. And I was, um, I just turned 16 and uh, the um, concerto competition was open to, you know, all the students. So I won this concerto competition and they said, okay, you get to play uh, the Weber concertino with the uh, student orchestra. And I said, oh, great. And my teacher, uh, Gary Gray was teaching there at the time. And he said, is, you know, this is, this is great. There's great opportunity, you know, and I get to the first rehearsal and it was conducted by a guy named Herbert Blumstead. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, huh, you know, this, you know, I, I didn't know who he was. And from the very first note, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> this is the real thing. This guy was like um, so committed and so expert and so like he knew how to tell this story. And I said, wow, this is incredible. And so he, this was back in the year 1973, my first wow. year at Aspen. And Herbert Blumstead recently has conducted us. In fact, he was scheduled to conduct us a couple of weeks ago. He's uh, 92. And yeah. I have to tell you, and we've played with him a couple of times in recent years in the Chicago Symphony. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, Herbert Blumstead is even more energetic at 92 <laughs> than he was at 45, if you, you know can imagine that. He has my utmost respect because I've seen him conduct live several times. And um, anyone, especially at, at his age, who mm. internalizes obscure Bruckner masses has my uh, just incredible <laughs> awe. I mean, he he's a superior musician. Just music superior. oozes from his fingers. It's just, yeah, and he's he's amazing. Vibes and an amazing human being. I mean, you're just... Yeah. Just, uh, just such, such warmth and humanity exude from this guy, and right. it's just like so uplifting. And you know, I was fifteen at the time, and or sixteen, just turned sixteen, and I, I um, now think back upon that and say, "Wow, that was a real gift," you know, that I <laughs> was able to have that opportunity. And I reminded him of that a couple of years ago <laughs> when he came to conduct us. We did Eroica with him. Oh, wow. And I, I came to his dressing room, you know, he's, he was like 91 at the time. So I, I, I found the program from when we played at Aspen in 1973 and brought it to him. Oh, yes, I remember. That was my <laughs> only year at Aspen. And I said, wow. He said, yeah, they invited me to go. And, um, and I went that year and I, I really enjoyed it, but never had the opportunity to go back. So wow. I said, well, I was lucky to have that. <laughs> Uh, I was, it was a serendipity for me because I'll never forget that amazing experience mm -hmm. and that whole summer, you know, just uh, so then I came back and people at Aspen were asking me, they said, so where are you going to, um, where are you going to go to uh, a conservatory? Where are you going to go study music? I said, well, you know, I, I'm all set. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to, uh, to uh, study pre-med at UCLA. And they were like shocked. They said, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, they, you've got a talent. You have to, you know, develop that talent. You can always go to medical school later. <laughs> said, well, okay, well, you know, I'll think about it. But, you know, in the end, those folks were all right because I, I just loved music so much and I still love music, obviously. Mm -hmm. And every weekend it was the American Youth Symphony with Melee and every spare moment it was playing chamber music with my friends. So finally it was like almost surreptitiously, I'd write, in those days there was no internet obviously, so I'd write away to, to, the, um, to Curtis and to Juilliard and to, to Boston University where my, um, uh, where my idol was teaching, Harold Wright. You know, he was playing in the Boston Symphony. He was principal clarinet in the Boston Symphony. Right. I idolized Harold um, because I had his recordings. And I see him on TV, uh, Symphony, um, they called it Evening at Symphony. Mm -hmm. And they'd play, you know, all the great masterworks. You know, 
never forget the uh, Dvorak Seventh Symphony on TV, and I get to see it. And I was like, gosh, you know, that's that's what I want to do. Yeah. And so I thought about it, and I went to the counselor at uh, at UCLA, and I said, you know, I'm in this pre med program, but I really want to try music as a career. And the counselor said to me, well, you understand that music is very um, competitive and, you know, only maybe one tenth of one percent of the people, um, you know, succeed at the level that you want to be at. So I said, well, you know what, I think I, I've got to give it a shot because I just love it so much. I can't imagine my life anything any different. Right. So one day at the dinner table, I, I gathered up all my strength. I had these catalogs from Juilliard and Curtis, and I said to my parents, I said, you know what? I'd sort of like to try music school and, you know, think of music as a career. <laughs> and they, I mean, you know, they knew I loved music. I mean, they, they, they supported me fully at that, you know. They got me lessons. They got me into the American Youth Symphony. They called Mele Mehta and everything like that. They supported me, but they figured, you know, Johnny's just going to go uh, study um, biology and then be be a, a doctor, and then he'll he'll do uh, he'll always do music, but it'll be as a hobby. But here I was like turning the tables on them, and, and it they looked at each other, and it was like maybe twenty seconds, and then they they looked back at me and they said, well, we want you to be happy. That's great. And they said, if you do your best, we will support you. And so that was the best gift my parents ever could give me. And, and I tell this to, to uh, teachers, you know, music teachers often say to me, they say, you know, I've got this really talented kid and um, he's so talented. He'd be an amazing, you know, professional, amazing artist. And his parents won't let him uh, follow music as a career. Right. And they, you know, they want him to be a, a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or something like that. And, and uh, invariably, you know, I hate to say this, but, you know, they're often Asian um, parents that are like supportive of their kids <laughs> to a fault. And, and, you know, it was, just, I just tell them that story. I just say, you know, my parents, uh, are Asian too, and they um, they said to me, "We we want you to be happy, so we're gonna we're gonna support you if you do your best, no matter what it is." And so it turned out to be music, and then um, I, I I got into Juilliard, and so I transferred after two years of UCLA in the pre med program to uh, Juilliard and started over. You know, I, I had never had any, you know harmony or uh, composition or music history or you know any of those classes so i started after two years of college i started over again in, at college taking all the basic music classes and of course you know taking uh clarinet and during my first year of juilliard uh there was an opening in my hometown orchestra in the los angeles philharmonic mm -hmm. So I decided, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll go and audition for the LA Philharmonic. And this yeah. was in 1975. Okay. So I went to uh, audition. And in those days, um, in LA at least, they did not have screens. You know, it's just like you go and play in front of the committee and everybody can see who you are. Nowadays, they have screens on almost all preliminary auditions. Right. So I went there and everybody's kind of, ha, ha, we know this guy, you know. <laughs> I, just like a, a short year before that, I'd, I'd you know, I'd go to, I didn't tell you, but every week I would go to the LA Philharmonic because they have like student tickets. You can get student tickets for like two bucks. And usually they were in the front row because mm -hmm. the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion is very big. And most of the people want to sit, you know, the people that have subscriptions want to sit, you know, where they can see the whole orchestra, like in the dress circle, like where my parents took me when I was five. Right. But um, they'd sell student tickets for two dollars and i'd sit in the front row i remember the very first time i ever heard the rite of spring in, in concert was from the first row and it was uh zubin made a conducting i'm looking up like this and he he doesn't use a score for that piece it's, you know he's got the whole thing memorized i'm looking up i've got my score my pocket score in, in my <laughs> in my hand from the rite of spring and i'm looking at the la philharmonic i'll never forget that and then 
another concert was Michael Tilson Thomas, who would conduct there as a guest conductor quite frequently. And he'd do uh, Torangalila by Messiaen. And then there was, um, they'd have oftentimes uh, pre-concert lectures. Mm -hmm. And so um, MTT would come before the concert and, and ask, you know, if, if anybody had any questions. So I, I said, uh, I have your recording of the Rite of Spring, you know, do you enjoy conducting this piece more than the Rite of Spring or do you like it? <laughs> and he said, my dear, there is no better and there's no worse. There's only different. <laughs> and so I remember MTT telling me that. And he was right. You know, they're they're both amazing works and, and he did both of them great and they're different. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had a lot of experiences when I was uh before I went off to uh, New York, but then when I went to New York, it was a whole new world opened up to me. You know, I had a little bit of a taste of that because Aspen is is sort of a Juilliard summer school in many ways. You know, there's a lot of faculty that go uh, teach at Aspen that are Juilliard. Mm -hmm. Same with in Indiana. There's a lot of, at that time, there were a lot of faculty from the Indiana uh, University School of Music. So I, got, I had gotten to know some of the Juilliard faculty and Juilliard students. So at, um, when I was in New York, it was like, gosh, you know, every day you could go to any number of performances. You, know, you could go to Carnegie Hall. You could go to Ellis Tully Hall. You could go to the Metropolitan. You could go to the, you know, it, Met Museum. It, you know, it's just like places you could hear world-class organizations and you'd have to pick. You know, there'd be like five, ten different concerts that you'd want to go to. And so I remember... Uh, you know, I'd be at Carnegie Hall a lot, and I, I could never afford to <laughs> buy tickets to Carnegie Hall. But I remember in those days, it's like if you had a dollar, you could go up to the um, parquet. It was the first balcony. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't the parquet. It was it was the um, whatever the first balcony was called. And there was an entrance there, and people would kind of line up and go in there. And I kind of um, slip in, and there would be an usher there, and just hand the usher a buck. <laughs> they just kind of look the other way, and I just walk in, and it's just like, oh, Carnegie Hall, and I'd hear the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I'd hear the Boston Symphony, I'd hear the Cleveland Orchestra. It was like hog heaven for me, and I'd get to hear, you know, incredible. I'll never forget when I got to hear the um, the Cleveland Orchestra with Mazel conducting and um, Emil Gillel's playing Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. Mm -hmm. It was just like jaw dropping. And in a place like that, these these experiences just kind of like embedded themselves in my heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And then uh, hearing the um, the Philadelphia Orchestra with uh, with Zubin Mehta conducting and doing the uh, Mahler second. And my orchestra director, Maley, flew in from LA for that because, you know, <laughs> His son is conducting the Philadelphia Orchestra as a guest conductor in Carnegie Hall doing one of the great masterpieces. So Maley, Maley said, um, you know, he wrote to me and he says, you're going to go uh, to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't miss it. And so so he um, he met me afterwards and took me up to see Zubin. And it was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I got to see all the backstage. You know, in those days, Carnegie Hall was different. Um, backstage from what it is now, you know, they, it was much more primitive and these was like these little hallways and, you know, you could hardly fit backstage. So they had to fit all the offstage percussion and the big bass drum and the cymbals and all that and a whole, you know, brass section backstage. I just remember when that, you know, came up, I'm just kind of like laughing to myself, all these little extra musicians crammed into the backstage area <laughs> to do the last movement of the Mahler second. And it was just, you know, all these memories are are just kind of flooding back to me. But so th this was my uh, experience at Juilliard for for in my first year, I came back to um, L.A. to audition yeah. bass clarinet in the L.A. Philharmonic. And I pl and everybody's kind of like smiling because, you know, we know this guy. He's just this young upstart. And then I played and they and they said, oh, well, you know, Sounds pretty good. <laughs> they they weren't gonna give me the job. They said, "Well, you know, I they you're on the right track, and you should keep taking auditions. Um, but you probably need a little bit more experience before you get this job." Mm -hmm. And I said, 
all right, fair enough. So I went back and I took a couple of more auditions. In my second year at Juilliard, I auditioned for the uh, Cincinnati Symphony, which also had a bass clarinet opening. So I went to Cincinnati on an extremely snowy, cold January day and trudging through literally, I think there was eight feet of snow <laughs> on that day. It, it, it's no kidding. It was like, gosh, you know, getting to the music hall on that day was just uh, a challenge. <laughs> so I got there and it was like, oh, wow, this is kind of a huge place. So I just played, you know, and I made the finals. I said, oh, that's so fantastic. You know, I'm in the finals. And I just kind of like, I didn't really expect this, you know, but um, I guess I should have, because at that point it was like, hey, you better get serious. You know, even though this is just your second year in music school, I think you've got something and you better go for it. So I, I sort of lost concentration during the finals, didn't get the job. But then when I came back to um, New York, I said, you know what, if I got that close, I bet it's going to be, I, I really have to buckle down and and um and win some some of these auditions right so a couple of months later it was april there was an audition in saint paul for the saint paul chamber orchestra principal clarinet hmm. and i said oh saint paul chamber orchestra okay they're the only full-time chamber orchestra in america and that would be pretty cool and um and the music director at the time was dennis russell davies and I'd worked with Dennis at Aspen. Um, and it's like, oh, this is a job I really want. You know, this this is a pretty, um, this would be a pretty cool situation. So I signed up. I went to St. Paul in April of 1977. And I um, I played. And they uh, asked me to be in the finals. So it was oh, great. Right. And in the finals, I got to play with the the wind quintet, you know, they, you have to play with the members of the orchestra. That's part of the trial, you know, and it was like, oh, this is heavenly. You know, the, um, at the time it was Carol Winsons on flute and, and, um, oh, it, it was, uh, oh, the oboe player that, um, taught at, uh, at Eastman for so many years, um, Kilmer, Richard Kilmer. It was these like superstars in the woodwind section. I'm saying, mm -hmm. okay, this is the job I really want. And so I played and I played with the wind quintet. I felt really good. And then they said, well, you know what? We haven't made a decision yet. We still have to deliberate. And it's like, oh my gosh. So we'll call you when we figure it out. And they didn't, they didn't call me until the next day. And I got a call from Dennis, Dennis Russell Davies. He called me and said, John, um, uh, you know, first of all, I have to tell you, you played amazing. And I thought you were fabulous. And everybody in the committee thought you were, you were great and your, your virtuosity and your, in just like your freshness. And I said, well, well, <laughs> but we decided to give the job to the other guy. Oh. I said, no, this is the job I really wanted. He said, you know what? We also discussed this in, in detail. We said to each other on the committee that, you know, this guy, this young clarinetist from Juilliard, he really wants a, uh, a symphonic career. And I said, no, but I, you know, I really want to play in your orchestra. <laughs> he, he said, no, we thought we would be holding you back if we gave you this job. Uh. And I said, oh no. I said, okay, plus, and he said, plus the fact the other guy had five years of experience in a professional orchestra already, and you're just a student. No, he didn't say that, but you know, <laughs> that's what I thought he was thinking. And so less than a month later, I was uh, auditioning for the Chicago Symphony, bass clarinet. and. Uh, I made the finals and there were four finalists. I mean, this was actually less than three weeks later. So I was preparing both of these auditions simultaneously. So I said, you know, Dennis said, you know, I, I'm cut out for um, symphonic. Well, I, then I better win this, this Chicago symphony audition. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
there were four finalists in, in the Chicago Symphony Audition. And it was like, we all played. It was, it all took place in this, uh, on the 20th of May in the morning. We played and it took them maybe half an hour. They gathered us all together and personnel manager comes up to me and he says, Mr. Ye, Sir George Schulte would like to speak with you. <laughs> Oh, and I said, oh my God, you know, and everybody's like congratulating me and shaking my hands, you know, so like, oh, wow. So I went into Maestro Schulte's room. <laughs> my dear, you're a very good boy. Now do a good job. And he pats me on the back and that was it. It was like, you're in. <laughs> I said, oh, wow. I guess Dennis Davies might've been right. You know, less than a month later, his um, prediction came true. You know, here I am in, a major symphony orchestra and um, a solo bass clarinet position. And uh, I just couldn't believe my stars. And this was three days before my 20th birthday. So I called my parents up from the uh, lobby of the Palmer House, which is across the street from Orchestra Hall. And I told my parents, I said, I got the job in Chicago. And they said, so are you going to take it? And I said, well, <laughs> You know, this this man only happened once in a lifetime. I said, they said, but you haven't finished school yet. You haven't finished college. I said, you know what? I really can't. This is an offer I cannot refuse. I have to take this job. Yeah. Well, okay, you know. And so, <laughs> well, you don't have your degree yet. <laughs> I said, on the job training will be the best kind, believe me. <laughs> And it, it was, and my very first rehearsal was two months later, beginning of July at, at Ravinia. So I started at the Ravinia Festival. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had, um, I've been invited to go back to Tanglewood because I was at Tanglewood in the summer of 1976 in the bicentennial year. And I, my, uh, I got to study with my mentor, Harold Wright, and it was just amazing. And I was invited back in 1977. So I had to call Tanglewood because the Chicago Symphony said, you know, when do you want to start? When can you start? You know, you, we need you as soon as possible. I said, well, I guess I can call Tanglewood and tell them I'm not coming. They <laughs> said, yeah, why don't you do that? I said, <laughs> okay. So I called Tanglewood and I said, you know, I, I got a, another job and um, it's with the Chicago Symphony. And they said, no. Said, yeah. Well, then you better take it <laughs> so i did and i went and my first uh, my first uh, gig was the uh Mahler's second symphony oh wow with uh, james levine conducting the chicago symphony in the summer of 1977 my very first time on stage with the chicago symphony orchestra was a rehearsal of Mahler's second and i was you know kind of nervous and you know had my thick pocket score with me and I, I had listened to all their recordings and I you know practiced my part and I got on stage and you know, everybody was so friendly and was so nice oh you're the new clarinet player oh nice to meet you you know it's just like you know and oh my gosh you know Mr. Hurst said oh call me bud you know uh, oh, oh well, okay I mean it's just like it, it was hard to call these like iconic musicians that I had that I had um you know worshipped on uh recordings you know, right I've seen a couple of times at carnegie hall they said you know we're colleagues now you have to call us by our first name <laughs> okay i'll see if i can get used to that and then after, during my first rehearsal it was like wow it was kind of the easiest thing that i had ever done because mm -hmm. everything was in the right place all i had to do was just plug my part in and it just was like absolute clockwork and i said wow, you know, I could get used to this. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my career in the Chicago Symphony. And um, since then, I've seen a lot change. You know, there, at this point, there are maybe nine musicians in the orchestra. We have like 105 members. Nine have been in the orchestra a little uh, longer than I have. So, wow, really? It, okay. It's changed the, uh, the, it, the turnover has been almost 90% since I mm. first joined. It's a completely different orchestra. It's, um, you know, the, first of all, the age, uh, the median age was about 55 when I joined the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And now it's considerably lower. We have, we have a lot of um, 
younger new musicians that were hired by uh, Daniel Barenboim and then by uh, our principal conductor after that, um, Bernard Heitink, and by Pierre Boulez, who was our principal guest conductor, and now by Maestro Muti, who's been our music director for the last 10 years. So we've seen a lot of change in our orchestra and uh, just, you know, it's been a privilege, truly, to, to witness everything that's happened. And my career has just been a joy. So 44 years in the Chicago Symphony. Mm -hmm. uh, at least, uh, how many music directors is that? That's what? So Sir George Schulte hired me. Mm -hmm. He was a music director until 1990. And then uh, Daniel Barenboim became right. music director. And he was music director until uh, 2008. And then uh, we had a period of a search for a music director. And we um, couldn't you know, find anybody at that point. So they, we all wanted um, Bernard Heitink. And so mm -hmm. they offered the music directorship to Bernard Heitink. And he said, well, you know, if you'd asked me, you know, 30 years ago, even if you asked me 20 years ago, I would have said yes. But, you know, I, I just kind of at the end of my career and, you know, let's compromise and I'll be principal conductor. I don't necessarily want any of the, uh, you know, administrative responsibilities, but I love your orchestra. And so he was principal conductor for five years. And he really did a lot for the orchestra, he raised the level hired several musicians. And uh, at the time we were able to continue the search for music director. And uh, we finally got uh, Ricardo Muti to be music director in 2010. So wow. it was, and that's been an amazing ride since then, you know. Uh, it's unfortunate this, this past year had completely canceled, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, and the you know the remainder the, this season is canceled of the orchestra concerts and everything from uh, March of the previous season. So we've basically lost about a, a season and a third of orchestra music. And uh, and that's it's sad, but at the same time, you know, it's it's created opportunities for our orchestra. You know, for the for the longest time several of us, and I've been fairly vocal about this, we really have to have a, a presence, uh, a worldwide presence all the time in video concerts. And the, the uh, ensemble that sets the standard there is the Berlin Philharmonic. Of course. They do digital <laughs> concert hall. And you know, my wife, Teresa and I, we subscribe to Digital Concert Hall and it's an incredible deal. It's like 150 euros and you can watch all their concerts all year long live the the and, and on the archives and movies and interviews it's just it's a it's it's amazing, amazing. yeah it's, it's it's great amazing it's incredible and i said why aren't we doing this you know we we have to put ourselves out there in this way and finally you know now that we're still uh prohibited from having live audiences in our in our hall at mm -hmm. the orchestra hall in chicago in um September, they started thinking about instituting uh, video programs from the Chicago Symphony. And in October, we started making video uh, recordings of chamber music only. So it's so it would be like a wind octet of Mozart, right? Or uh, like like I said, the Soldier's Tale of Stravinsky, and um, it's usually be, be like a string quartet or a vel quartet or a, or a wind quintet, you know, that I played a Mio wind quintet and, um, or the Stravinsky octet for winds, things like that, that are on the smaller level because we can only get so many people we're only allowed to because of the health regulations, because of the COVID. Um, so right. certain number of, of uh, players on stage and we have to stay distanced. And those that don't play wind instruments have to wear a mask. So, so we've been doing these programs and they've been artistically very satisfying. And um, it's a way for us to continue to communicate with our audience, even though 
the audience cannot come into the hall um, in person at this at this point. Right, but, right. But in the future, uh, in a couple of weeks, we are going to play Mozart's uh, Grand Partita, the the B flat, big B flat serenade for twelve winds and double bass, and that'll be that'll be one of the larger ensembles that we have been able to accommodate on our stage for these CSO TV shows. So if you right. go to the CSO.org website, you can find CSO TV. And every week there's a, there's a new program and we rotate amongst the members of the orchestra. Well, that's great. But, but CSO doesn't really have any um, archival concerts from, from previous seasons. They didn't really do that sort of thing. We do have a few and, and they are, um, they have been shown on Facebook and on YouTube. Oh, they have. Yes, uh, there's one that's been shown quite a bit, and that's Beethoven's Ninth that we did uh, maybe about 10 years ago uh, with, oh, well, maybe that, that was about five years ago. We, we did a Verdi Requiem 10 years ago in the in the Verdi Bicentennial Okay, that was uh, uh, also videotaped and broadcast live uh, all over the world in real time and on, on Verdi's um, 200th birthday. Wow. Uh, in October of, of um, whatever year it was. <laughs> and so, but uh, it, that was, that turned out great. And I said, well, we did it. Why can't we do it on a regular basis? So now we, we kind of have to it's, do that. Yeah. It's, it's, we, we all have to think differently about the future now. <laughs> yeah. It's um, a new reality. So in, uh, in, in 40 plus years with the CSO, obviously your, your first, rehearsal with him and first concert of the Mahler second was probably very memorable. I, I can't even imagine that. Um, but have there been any other concerts that, that for some reason or other, you'll just never forget? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, a, a lot of them happened in my first season or two in the orchestra. And um, I remember my very first season, we, uh, we did a pension fund concert and pension fund concerts are special because they're, they only happen once a season. And usually they bring in a very special guest. And this particular year, my first year in the orchestra, they brought in uh, Carla Maria Giulini as the guest conductor and Daniel Barenboim as the piano soloist. Oh, wow. And so we did an all Brahms program and uh, Giulini conducted the first symphony and Barenboim played the um, the second piano concerto, the B flat piano concerto, and that performance just you know really really stays with me. It's mm -hmm. it's a pretty amazing memory. And then more recently, um, just a couple of years ago, after having uh, retired from the Chicago Symphony, Daniel Barenboim, twelve years later, made his uh, his reappearance with the Chicago Symphony, mm -hmm. and we did the uh, complete Mavlast of Smetana, mm. which was absolutely spectacular. And for me, it was very special because um, I was playing first clarinet and my wife, Teresa, who's also clarinetist, was playing second clarinet. And um, there are a lot of very, very like intimate and delicate two clarinet uh, parts in this, in this saga. It's, mm. you know, six tone poems of, of Smetana and so that was a very, very memorable concert. Um, Barenboim's return to the Chicago Symphony after yeah. 12 years of absence. And then um, and playing, you know, with, with my wife sitting next to me. Yeah. So th those are like some standouts uh, of, of our uh, time, of my time in the Chicago Symphony. Of course, there are tours, tours that we've taken to, um, you know, of course we've been to Europe many times, same places, you know, but then, We've been to uh, Australia only once, and that Australian tour in 1988 was was very memorable because it, it was the only time the orchestra ever went there, and mm -hmm. it's the only time I've ever been to Australia, and uh, until now, I've only been there once. That oh, was wow. it. And then uh, a tour to South America only once in the year 2000. Let's see. I guess it was the year 2000. Yep, we took a tour to Australia, uh, to um, South America, and we played in Buenos Aires. This was with uh, Daniel Barenboim, and uh, Buenos Aires is his hometown. Mm -hmm. So that was very special. We played in Teatro Colón, where he played many, many times, and this was our experience there. And, and then we played in uh, Brazil, we played in 
Rio de Janeiro and oh, wow. Sao Paulo, New Hall in Sao Paulo. That used to be a train station. So, so they they um, turned this hall or this this train station in um, in Sao Paulo into a wonderful concert hall. And um, I, it, we we had the uh, acoustician with us. There's a guy named Russell Johnson, very famous acoustician. Mm -hmm. And at the time, our orchestra had just renovated Orchestra Hall. And it was, let's put it this way, we, um, they spent a lot of money doing it. And the results were less than ideal. And so it's like, oh, how do we, how do we get Orchestra Hall, you know, improved? How do we get it sounding as good as we want it? Uh, and so they'd, they hired another acoustician, and this was Russell Johnson. Uh -huh. Russell Johnson would go on tour with us and listen to our orchestra play in different other halls, including a couple of halls that he had um, designed. And one of them was this um, hall in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, I said, well, you know, if you can do this to a train station, why don't we turn um, Union Station in Chicago into a concert hall? It's like... <laughs> You can tear down Orchestra Hall and you can you can turn Union Station into our new concert hall. And he kind of chuckled. He says, well, you know, I really prefer to build uh, a hall from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And so we played in Budapest and um, Boulez was conducting us at that at that time on, on that tour. Boulez took us on a few tours also. And we played in brand new hall, probably the first concert or two that were given in this new hall in Budapest that was uh, acoustically designed by Russell Johnson. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, these were some, and my parents were with me on that tour. It was, it was a really, really fun time. My wife and my, and, and my parents were with me on that, on that tour. And it was in 2005 and, uh, yeah, we went to Vienna. We went to, so these are places that we've been to several times, but we've been to Russia once in 1990. Mm -hmm. And this was, uh, a unique tour they made it optional because it was it was like sort of um an arduous tour because at the time we they couldn't uh guarantee that we could even get good food you know because in those days behind the iron curtain you know it was like those were the days where the russians were would line up around the block just to get uh, a, a loaf of bread or a pair of shoes right. you know so we were going into maybe an unknown situation in terms of would we be able to be up to our standard, our general standard of touring. So what they ended up doing was uh, hiring a, um, a chef and bringing all the food, shipping all the food to from America to Russia. We only had two stops, St. Petersburg. It was Leningrad at the time. Uh -huh. and moscow this was in 1990 before uh, while the while the soviet union was still was still there and um we we would have all our uh, meals together the whole orchestra and the, the whole group orchestra group you know guests and staff would eat together uh, meals prepared by by the um by the chef that they brought along that was the only way they could guarantee wow that we could you know find food but I have a very good friend. My very best friend in the orchestra in the Chicago Symphony was Albert Igolnikov. He he is a he was principal second violinist in the Chicago Symphony until five years ago when he retired. He used to be he played in the Leningrad Philharmonic for twenty years before he emigrated to America and joined our orchestra. Mm -hmm. So he had friends in the uh, in the Leningrad Philharmonic um, that would invite him over to their house. So he'd drag me along and said, come on, we got to go to my friend's house. And they'd have this big spread and we'd have like caviar and all these incredible Russian foods. And it was like, well, these guys, you know, didn't have to wait in line for a loaf of bread. And I said, how did you get all this unbelievable food? Black market. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, and I, I actually, I speak Russian because Russian is my second language. I studied it in, in high school. Your wife's Russian, isn't she? Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Duh. And I, I studied it in, in, in high school because I thought, 
oh, this is kind of exotic. I think I'll just take an exotic language, but it really came in handy. You know, when we went to, when we went on tour to Russia, it was like, you know, I was able to visit with my friend Albert's, um, you know, colleagues, mm -hmm. former colleagues, and just had a great time. In fact, one of them just called me a couple of days ago, their son, the guy that played in the Leningrad Philharmonic with Albert, was a, was a, a cellist and his son was a clarinetist. So I made friends with his son and he's since moved to America anyway. So it's just, you know, it's in this day of, of COVID in this year of COVID, we've been able to reconnect with a lot of people that ordinarily we wouldn't have a chance to, you know, usually so busy, you know, preparing right. a different program every week, you know, doing it just like hard to keep up have a little bit of breathing space this year. And so I'm grateful to you for inviting me to do this. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's great. And I'm, I'm so happy to talk to you as we, as we wrap up in the next few minutes, I want to remind everyone that, that who's watching, uh, if you have any comments or questions for John, feel free to, uh, to, uh, send us a message. I know we've gotten a few while we've been talking and, uh, John, I don't know if you can read this or not, but... Uh, oh, hi, Joel. Okay, Joel <laughs> and I played in the American Youth Symphony together. Yeah, there you go. And <laughs> Joel's, Joel's uh, daughter is, of course, your ex current executive director. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Small world. <laughs> it's a small world. It's just like incredible, incredible. Yeah, he also Joel. writes... Uh, Jaws dropped at the uh, American Youth Symphony Orchestra rehearsal. Oh, and it was announced that you had won the audition of Chicago. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that was already a couple of years after I had um, been out of the American Youth Symphony. But then after I joined Chicago, he invited me back as a soloist. So I got to play the Nielsen Clarinet Concerto with American Youth um, after I had been in the Chicago Symphony three years. Right. Um, we also have a question from uh, John Hilbert. And his question is, uh, are there pieces in a person's repertoire uh, to be considered uh, an accomplished clarinetist? Um, uh, for example, Mozart's clarinet concerto or a mixture of classical and jazz? Do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, certainly the repertoire is, uh, you know, important. I mean, and we have a couple of absolute gems of masterpieces and the Mozart clarinet concerto is certainly the the pinnacle of our repertoire. In terms of concertos with orchestra, there maybe there aren't as many as there are for violin or piano. I mean, there certainly aren't, but there still are some really good ones. And actually, actually I've been working on, and this is something for you to put in the hopper mm -hmm. for the future, is the John Williams clarinet concerto. Of course, yeah. I've been working on the John Williams clarinet concerto um, during this year because you know I have time to now. I've, I've had the music for several years, and it was written for my um, mentor in Los Angeles, Michelle Zakowski, who was principal clarinetist in the LA Philharmonic for you know over fifty years. Just recently retired, and she she has um, gifted me with her music to the. Uh, to the John Williams concerto, and she wants me to play it. So, so I'm, I'm, you know, it's been sitting on my shelf for several years, and now I'm actually having a chance to learn it. And it's, it's a wonderful piece. It's, it's big symphony orchestra, very colorful. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to playing it one day. Great, great, uh, John. I just want to wrap up with some thoughts on uh, on education, and especially because your you, you share my ideals with uh, love. Is, you know, we're talking about John Williams, but our our love of of new repertoire and new you know new energy, new composers, new music. Um, but you know what? Uh, how, how to phrase this question? Yeah, we played Maria Grenfell's. Um, That's right. I mean, with you. That was that was a wonderful experience to play with your soloist, the bass the bass player, and the and cello player from your orchestra. That was at yeah, a very that was special. a great concert. And I, I love uh, what I loved about that concert is you know it was something as established as the the Copeland Clarinet Concerto, and then this this opportunity to uh, experience this this you know shorter work that uh, highlights both two of our principal players and and you on clarinet, and a delightful little piece. You know, I, I had a lot of fun with that as well. Um, so, 
You know, we we at the North State Symphony has, have been lucky to have not just you, but uh, also John Hagstrom come out sure. and play with us. And both of you, you know, are, are so, so approachable, so enthusiastic, um, very willing to just get out there and, 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 and talk about your passions for music and, and youth and outreach. And, you know, what would you say to aspiring Chicago Symphony clarinetists out there? You know, what, what, you know, succinct piece of advice would you give them? Yes. Well, it would be this, to keep your ears, your eyes, and your heart open. Take it all in. Listen and soak it all up. You know, go to performances. And now, nowadays we have YouTube, which is a, a treasure trove of, of amazing resources. Listen to the great performers. Uh, you know, listen to the Berlin Philharmonic. Listen to the Chicago Symphony. Watch and see how they do it. You know, absorb it, and then um, remember how it goes, and then make it your own and emulate it. Always be open and and be willing to you know have good vibes wash over you. I I just love um, being able to interact with musicians. It's like having a conversation with somebody if you're playing together with somebody. And, you know, always have goodwill. I would mm -hmm. say a goodwill is really means a lot. You know, you, you, you hear about, oh, you know, music is so competitive and music is so cutthroat yeah. and music is so, you know, it's like if you, if you look the other, don't look, you know, somebody is always looking over your shoulder and going to stab you in the back. Well, you know what? <laughs> that there's no room in our in our um business for bad vibes no. and so i would say you know always be good to each other and and have an open willingness to learn somebody may have a an idea that you might not agree with at first but you know if you hear them out you might come around to it exactly exactly that, that's great piece of advice and i have one final question for you and I asked this in a very broad range because uh, my answer to this question is actually not a, a musical experience. And my question is, what is the most uh, inspirational experience that you've had? You know, it can be musical. But for me, one time when I was living in Boston, not actually the first time that I did this, uh, I went to a Red Sox game. And the, the energy that I felt in that stadium on that day was was one of the most amazing things I've ever felt. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what that experience is for you. Is it a musical experience or is, is something else in your life that that sort of speaks to the, the power of, of community and coming together? Right. Well, you know what? I, I have come to realize over over the years that balance is the key to life. And so... That means all the elements have to be balancing one another. And I think at the beginning of my career, I was very, very driven to, you know, playing everything and doing everything and, you know, saying, never saying no. <laughs> but um, uh, my wife, Teresa, who's also a fine musician and uh, an educator and, you know, incredible partner. She really is the catalyst for me to have balance in my life. And, and our family is, you know, a major part of that balance. So, so I have three daughters and the, the youngest one is in high school. Now we've, we've been, we've been quarantining in our, um, you can see my basement here in, in our vacation <laughs> home and, in Michigan, we are um, not in Chicago at the moment, but we've been here in uh, rural Michigan, Sister Lakes, Michigan, since uh, the beginning of November, and we basically spent the entire summer here also. So we never thought we'd we'd be staying here all the time, but right. we had to have. Uh, I guess the Wi-Fi is working pretty well, <laughs> I and mean, we had to have a Wi-Fi installed here so our daughter could go to school online because oh. she's in the. Um, in the International Baccalaureate program at uh, Lincoln Park High School, which is our local public school in Chicago. And all their learning has been virtual, online. Right. Ever since uh, the beginning of this year, school year. And that's all she's known in high school. She's a freshman. 
And so, you know, we have, um, and then I have two older daughters that, that are married and, and have lives of their own and families of their own. And my middle daughter lives in Minnesota and she has, she's actually a, a Juilliard graduate also. She's, she graduated in 2011 from Juilliard in percussion, but she's much more well known now as not a musician, but a food network personality. She has a, her own food network show called um, Girl Meets Farm. <laughs> and, and she's also a, a, a best-selling book author. She's got a book called Molly on the Range. And so she's, she's embraced um, the culinary arts. But my eldest daughter, Jenna, is the one that's really trained in culinary. And she works uh, in, in Chicago at a catering company. And she's the one that's really trained as a, as a chef. And so food is a very big um, important <laughs> part of my life. It, it creates one of the big balances. So I always have a balanced meal. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, you know, food is important to, to, I would say, us as well. And, and I've sense. certainly become uh, more of a chef in the past few years than I have been. Um, it's, it, it does provide a nice balance. It's, it's a way to just focus on, on one thing and, and block out the external world for a short amount of time. And I appreciate that. Oh, okay. But John, um, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your time with us this evening. And uh, I, I hope it was as fun for everyone who gets to see this video now and in the future uh, about learning about your past and how, how you became, you know, who you are and, <laughs> and got to spend such a, a, a significant amount of time with one of the great orchestras of the world. Um, I know I never forget every single time I get to walk into orchestra hall in Chicago is just an, incredible experience and I, I hope i get to do it again soon <laughs> i hope to see you there again I, I and and thank you so much for inviting me to chat with you and also for for um collaborating the amazing collaboration in november a couple of years ago it was it was something that i'll always remember and i hope we can um, get together with the north state symphony again uh, I, would, I would sincerely love that, John, and I hope to be able to collaborate with you again soon. So thank you all to everyone who is watching uh, this evening, and uh, thank you so much, John, and we hope you and your family and all your friends continue to stay, to stay uh, happy and safe, and uh, we get to, uh, make to, uh, I hope we get to make music in I hope any so. form soon. <laughs> stay healthy, everybody. Stay safe. Okay. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye.